Weathering, soil, and erosion. Hey, Sphinx! What's up with your face? <laughs> yeah. Why does it look like someone's been scraping at it with a giant nail file? Whoa! Quit talking about the Sphinx like that before you get mummified. Besides, it's not the Sphinx's fault its face is all messed up. That's just what happens to rock over time. It's called weathering. <laughs> weathering. Weathering is the process by which rock materials get broken down. Just think about old Sphinxy. Sitting there in the desert over thousands of years, the desert winds whipping grains of sand across its rock face. Over the years, this constant sand lashing has scraped away major portions of that Sphinx's face. However, you may be interested to know that some scientists think the Sphinx dates all the way back to when Egypt was lush and green before it was even a desert. These scientists think that some of the Sphinx's wear is actually from rainwater. It's true. There is a theory that some of the Sphinx's wear is from very ancient water. Luckily, we're not here to talk about archaeology. We're here to talk about weathering. And you know what? Wind and water are both examples of things that cause weathering. But that's not all. Other causes of weathering are gravity, ice, plants, animals, air, and chemicals. As you may have guessed, there are lots of different ways that weathering can occur. You know the way that the sand is grinding away at the Sphinx's face? Scientists call that form of weathering abrasion. Abrasion is when sand particles or rocks wear away the surface of a rock by continually scraping against it. Different forces like wind, water, and gravity can all cause abrasion. Think about it. That sand didn't just walk up to the Sphinx and scratch it by itself. The wind blew it there. Flowing water can cause abrasion as it drags along rocks and pebbles, causing them to bump into each other and scrape each other smooth. And then there's gravity. How do you think gravity causes weathering? Gravity makes things fall, tumble, and roll. In the process of falling, tumbling, and rolling, rocks bump into other rocks. That's abrasion. Ice, plants, and animals also cause weathering. Have you ever seen a plant growing through a crack in a rock? As the plant grows, it can split the rock right open with its roots. A similar thing happens when water in a crack turns to ice. As the water freezes, it expands and slowly wedges the rock open. Animals that burrow in the ground can also move and break up rocks as they make their way around. Drat those darn moles! If they ruin my garden one more time, I swear I'm gonna get them! And when I do, I, well, uh, I'll, um, dress them up in miniature outfits with fringes and pom-poms. <laughs> That'll teach them. Now listen up. All the types of weathering we've just learned about are types of mechanical weathering. This just means that the rock is broke down by physical process. But weathering can also happen through chemical process. Let's look at some forms of chemical weathering. Air, water, and acid are all things that can cause chemical weathering. Have you ever seen a rock turn this reddish-brown color? This is the result of minerals in the rock chemically reacting with oxygen in the air. We common folk call this rusting. Scientists call it oxidation. Hey, have you ever wondered how caves are formed? Chemical reactions resulting from water and acid can cause rocks to dissolve over time. Acids like sulfuric acid and nitric acid can slowly eat away at some types of rock, such as limestone. And that's how you get these crazy cave formations. As with all geologic processes, weathering occurs over long periods of time. It takes thousands of years for that Sphinx's face to get gnawed away. But there are factors that can cause weathering to happen faster or slower, like climate, temperature, and elevation. I mean, think about it. Why do you think a hot and humid climate would cause weathering to occur faster than, say, a cool and dry climate? Remember, weathering is the process by which rock materials get broken down. Weathering is a process that is continuously happening on Earth. It is responsible for the way many of our landforms look. Weathering is also responsible for something else that we find all around us on Earth. Can you guess what that is? <laughs> Soil. Did you know that something like 20% of Earth's surface is covered in soil? Except for glaciers and the most barren parts of the planet, soil can be found virtually everywhere on Earth. But what exactly is soil and where does it come from? What is soil? Hmm, that's a good question. 
Basically, soil is a loose mixture of all kinds of stuff. For one thing, soil is made of tons of tiny pieces of weathered rock. Also mixed in there is decomposed organic material from dead plants, animals, and bacteria. This decomposed organic material found in soil is called humus. Huh? No, not hummus. Humus. <gasps> One of the most important things about soil is that it supports the growth of plants. And where would we be without plants? We wouldn't even have breakfast cereal. As you can see, soil is essential to supporting life on this planet. Of course, not all soil is good for growing plants. Remember how we said soil is a loose mixture of a bunch of stuff? Well, whether or not a soil is good for planting depends on just what stuff it's made of and how the stuff is mixed. Say Magnolia Polnicek wants to start a farm. She needs to choose a piece of land with soil that's good for growing. Let's learn about some properties of soil and see if we can help Polnicek decide where to stake her claim. First of all, the type of soil you have depends on the type of rock it comes from. That will determine the types of mineral it has in it. In order for plants to grow and grow and grow, soils need to have a high level of fertility. That means they need to contain enough nutrients to support plant growth. You know, like water and minerals. Soils that have a high nutrient content are good for growing. Good soil also means soil that has a good texture. You see, soils are made of a blend of different types of particles, such as sand, silt, and clay. The proportions of these particles in a type of soil determines that soil's texture. For example, loam is a type of soil in which the levels of sand, silt, and clay are relatively equal. Soil texture is important for many reasons. For good farming conditions, you want a soil with a texture that can easily transport water to your plants and that can easily be tilled by farmers. Uh-huh. Uh-huh, yeah. Looks like our girl found her spot. Wait, what's that? Mutant gym buffs for neighbors. <laughs> huh. Unfortunately, good soil doesn't always mean good neighbors. <laughs> good luck, Magnolia. Yeah. Like many things in the natural world, soil is arranged into layers. These layers are called horizons. They're called horizons because they're horizontal. Get it? The layers of rock beneath all those horizons is called the bedrock. The topmost layer of soil is called topsoil. This freshly formed soil is generally the most nutrient-rich layer. That's because there's a lot of freshly decayed dead plant and animal stuff mixed into it. Remember how you buried your dead dog in the backyard last year? Mom sure got some nice tulips growing out there this year, didn't she? Didn't she? Erosion and deposition. What is erosion? Well, we've already learned that rock materials get broken down by weathering. Erosion is like weathering's older brother. It's in the same family, but it's got a driver's license. Say what? Well, weathering breaks rocks down, right? Erosion is when the broken down stuff gets transported, you know, carried away. It then gets deposited somewhere else. So erosion is when weather materials are carried away and deposition is when they're dropped off somewhere else. Just like when your mom piles you and your friends into the old minivan and drops you guys off at the mall. So what are some ways that stuff gets eroded or transported elsewhere? Well, let's think about it. What types of things could carry a bunch of tiny pieces of rock from one place to another? Wind, water, and... Uh, uh, why does everyone always forget gravity? When rocks fall down steep slopes, gravity is responsible. This type of erosion is called mass wasting. Mass wasting can happen very slowly over time, or it can happen suddenly, like a landslide. But you can't get mad at gravity. That wouldn't make sense. It's invisible. Earth's surface is constantly being shaped and reshaped by the interplay between erosion and deposition. Stuff is constantly getting built up and broken down and built up and broken down. Erosion and soil conservation. I heard that soil in the United States is in danger. What? What do you mean? That's just what I heard, okay? Gosh. Let's get our facts straight. Soil in the United States and elsewhere is in danger. This is due to increasing rates of erosion. You see, erosion is a natural process. 
It's a part of the Earth's endless ebb and flow. But sometimes, human activity causes things to be eroded faster than they naturally would. When this happens, it can spell trouble for cheerleaders. It can spell trouble for everyone, not just cheerleaders. You see, the natural world tends to have its own built-in system of checks and balances to keep things in a state of dynamic equilibrium. Soil gets eroded, but it also gets restored through the process of deposition. When human activity interferes with these processes, it can cause problems. For example, when land is cleared for farming or construction, this means getting rid of the plants and trees whose roots serve as anchors for the soil, holding it to the ground. This can leave the soil vulnerable to wind and water erosion. It can cause the soil to get carried away faster than it is naturally replaced. The worst thing for a farmer is to have that precious topsoil with all of its nutrients carried away. So soil erosion is no good. One thing farmers do to try and protect against wind erosion is plant rows of trees called windbreaks at the edges of their fields. This is just one of many conservation techniques used to counter the effects of human development on the natural world. Surface water, groundwater, and glaciers. Did you know that 70% of Earth's surface is covered in water? That's two-thirds of the entire planet. A whopping 97% of that water is salt water. Of that tiny amount of remaining fresh water, 68.7% is frozen in glaciers and 30% is under the ground. That means that only about 1% of Earth's fresh water is available on the surface. All in all, planet Earth is made mostly of water, so it may not surprise you to know that water is the dominant force of erosion and deposition on the planet. Water is matter. Just like all forms of matter, water is never created or destroyed, but only changes form. The three forms of water are liquid water, frozen water, or ice, and water vapor. Just like all matter cycles on Earth, the water cycle is a closed system. That means that water never enters or leaves the planet, but cycles through it over and over again. And that means that the water you're drinking could be the very same water that once melted off the face of a snowman built by your great-great-great-grandfather. Far out. Think of water like our planet's master sculptor. It's kind of like a sculptor who is never fully satisfied with his work. Instead, water changes the surface of the planet again and again, creating many strange and wonderful landforms in the process. Caves and cliffs and crevices, oh my! Let's take a peek at some of the ways water sculpts the planet. Surface water. Question of the day. How was the Grand Canyon formed? Was it A, carved out by the Colorado River, B, gnawed out of the rock by a giant prehistoric mole, or C, blown into existence by runaway preschoolers playing with dynamite? A? You got it! Over millions of years, the Colorado River literally carved its way through the rock, carrying soil and other weathered materials from the riverbed to farther and farther downstream. As you can see, rivers like the Colorado are major sources of erosion. But let's take a step back. How are rivers formed? Here's how it works. Rivers start out as little streams. The stream begins carrying away bits of soil and rock and eventually carves out a channel or path. Over time, the channel gets wider and deeper. And before you know it, you have a river. With just a few odd exceptions, rivers always flow downhill because of gravity. Just think of them like really long water slides. Rivers tend to begin near the tops of mountains and gradually meander down to the ocean. All along the way, they continue to pick stuff up and drop it off, continually reshaping the landscape. It goes like this. See how the river snakes back and forth like, well, a snake? Each time the river swings around a curve, the water along the outside of the curve picks up speed. Like, you know, when you go around a curve on a water slide and your tube flies up along the edge of the slide and for a second it feels like you're going to flip over? It's kind of like that. When a river goes around a bend, the water at the edge of the curve picks up speed and erodes more stuff from the riverbank. At the same time, the water at the inside of the curve slows down and deposits stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, the Hydroponic Limbs Project of Manchester presents Log Flume. Over 
the years, as a river keeps eroding and depositing stuff, it eventually fills itself in and the flow of water moves over. In this way, rivers actually change their own courses. We can see this clearly in an aerial photo. Here's the San Juan River in Utah. And here is the ghost of the San Juan River's past. Rivers work in systems. Streams join together to form larger streams and eventually rivers. Rivers join together to form larger rivers. Overall, streams and rivers form huge networks of water flowing downhill, shaping and reshaping the landscape as they go, and eventually emptying into the salty oblivion of the sea. Groundwater. Isn't it stunning? What is it? Could it be a famous sculpture in the Museum of Fine Arts? But who is the artist? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What you're looking at cannot be found in the Museum of Fine Arts. What you're looking at is an underground cave, and the artist or sculptor is the one and only water. Wait, you mean there is water underground? How did it get there? Yes, there is water underground. It's called groundwater. It gets there by seeping down through tiny spaces in soil and rock called pores. Just like surface water, groundwater flows downhill with the force of gravity. And just like surface water, it carves through rocks and deposits eroded materials elsewhere. Unlike surface water, groundwater can sometimes end up with higher amounts of acid in it. This is what makes it so good at carving caves. Let's see how this works, shall we? Groundwater is underground. That means it's carving through rock and dirt all day. As it does this, it dissolves minerals. These dissolved minerals can make the water acidic. The more acidic the water is, the better it becomes at carving rock, especially a type of rock called limestone. Acid in the water causes a chemical reaction that cuts through that limestone like butter. Okay, not that easily, but more easily than non-acidic water. A cave begins to be formed when groundwater flows into cracks in the limestone. From there, it continues to dissolve the rock. Over time, the crack widens into a larger opening called a crevice. Eventually, the water carves out a wide underground channel. The wider the channel, the more water it draws in from the nearest river or lake. This forms the cave's main stream. Now here's the cool part. If the underground stream carves deeper into the ground or the ground rises, the water will continue to seep ever lower into crevices. Eventually, this will create a lower level to the cave. Over time, water will continue to trickle down through the crevices to this lower level. This constant trickling slowly sculpts the cave into a wonderland of rock formations, like the one we see here. So water is the sculptor of this cave, but it doesn't work alone. It has a handy assistant. That assistant is acid from dissolved minerals. Let's talk a bit more about groundwater. Remember, groundwater makes up about 30% of Earth's fresh water, and it can be an important source of water for humans. Sometimes groundwater can be accessed through a spring, which is an area where the water breaks through the surface of the ground. People also dig wells to access groundwater. Both springs and wells can be important sources of drinking water for many people. When humans use groundwater as a resource, we can be assured that it is constantly being replenished by rain and nearby water sources. However, it is important not to use groundwater supplies at a faster rate than they are naturally replenished. This can cause the surface of the groundwater called the water table to drop and wells to run dry. Just like surface water, groundwater is a resource that must be conserved. I still remember the day the well at my parents' summer cottage ran dry. Come tea time and my mother forced me to cry into her cup. <gasps> like that. Glaciers! Did you know that nearly 70% of Earth's freshwater is frozen in glaciers? That makes them pretty significant containers of water on the planet. But what exactly is a glacier? A 
A glacier is basically a huge hunk of moving ice. Glaciers form in places that are extremely cold, like polar regions, or places at high elevations, like mountains. Glaciers form as a result of snow piling and piling up and never melting away. Over time, the layers of snow get so packed in under all the weight that they begin to form ice crystals. With all the weight on top of it, this ice begins, ever so slowly, to slide downward with gravity. This gigantic moving mass of ice and snow is a glacier. Did you catch that? Glaciers move. Very, very slowly, they inch their way downward under the force of gravity. Let's get a closer look at glacial movement. You would think that glaciers are so heavy that they wouldn't be able to move, right? But the opposite is true. The glacier's enormous weight is actually what causes it to move. You see, the weight of the glacier causes ice on the bottom layer to melt and refreeze. This creates a layer of slush that allows the great ice beast to slide more easily. Meanwhile, ice in the interior of the glacier keeps bending and changing shape under all of the weight. We call this deforming. This continuous changing of shape allows the grains of ice to keep sliding past each other, creating a river of ice. You're a river of ice! Oh. As they flow, these rivers of ice scrape away features of the landscape, smoothing it out. They also carve out new landforms, and of course, they pick up lots of rocks and stuff and drop them off elsewhere. And we're not just talking puny little pebbles. Glaciers can pick up and move boulders the size of buildings. Check it out. Here's a sample image of a mountain before any glacial action occurred. Here's the same mountain after some glaciers slid down it over thousands or even millions of years. As you can see, glaciers do some serious carving to the earth turning smooth mountainsides into jagged peaks and valleys. Remember, just like surface water and groundwater, glaciers are important forces of erosion and deposition on Earth. <laughs> Wind, waves, and shorelines. How does a message in a bottle make it from the coast of Long Island all the way to the United Kingdom? How is it that particles of dust from Asia find their way to the western United States? It's not like dust can buy a plane ticket. So what's the deal? The deal is wind and water. Moving wind and water are agents of erosion and deposition. They are constantly sweeping weathered materials away and carrying them someplace else. In doing so, Wind and water contribute to shaping the Earth's surface. Wind. Those dust particles from Asia weren't carried to the U.S. on an airplane or ship. They were carried by the wind. Wind carries all sorts of things, from dust to dirt to sand to umbrellas. It moves them from one place to another. You know, erosion and deposition. When it comes to erosion, wind is not so different from a river. Just like a river, wind picks stuff up and drops it off as it slows down. Rivers slow down as they go around bends. Wind slows down when it turns into obstacles like plants or walls. Sand dunes are a good example of wind erosion and deposition in action. Dunes are the result of wind-blown sand collecting over time. Let's take a look at some dunes. Here we have dune A and dune B. Pretty different, huh? Dunes are cool because they can show us what the wind would look like if it weren't so invisible. It's like throwing a sheet over an invisible man to make out the shape of his face. What do you think the shape of these dunes can tell us about the wind that formed them? Lots of things. For example, the shapes of dunes can tell us the strength and direction of the wind. Which type of dune do you think was made by stronger winds? Dune A or Dune B? One more thing about dunes. Did you know they can migrate? As wind carries sand over the top of the dune, a new top eventually piles up in front of the old one. As this happens over and over again, they move kind of like a tractor tread. I have a recurring dream, a nightmare really, wherein I'm being chased by sand dunes. Ever so slowly, they, they creep closer, closer, closer. I am not a beach person. Waves. Hey, there's those sand dunes again. I thought we'd moved on to waves. But wait, those sand dunes kind of look like ocean waves, don't they? Hmm, is this some kind of coincidence? 
Turns out waves, like sand dunes, are also caused by wind. And like wind, waves cause erosion. But how does this work? How does wind create waves? Mm. It's like this. Say we wave a fan over this bowl of punch. Storm at sea. The air coming from the fan causes ripples in the punch. The same thing happens when wind blows over water. All waves have a height and a wavelength. The height of a wave is the distance between its highest point, called the crest, and lowest point, called the trough. The wavelength is the distance between the crest of one wave and the crest of the next. The size of a wave depends on the speed of the wind, how long the wind is blowing, and the surface area of the water. So I thought I saw this killer wave, but then I realized I was in the kiddie pool. The sun gives you gnarly hallucinations, man. The larger the surface area of the water, the larger the waves will be. So an ocean will generally always have larger waves than a lake. A lake will have larger waves than a pond, and a pond will have larger waves than a bathtub. Now, just like anything else in this impermanent world, no wave lasts forever. They're all destined to eventually reach a shore somewhere and break. Here's how it goes down, literally. As a wave approaches land, the water gets shallower and shallower. Once the depth of the water is about half the wavelength, the wave starts to scrape the bottom. This causes the bottom of the wave to slow down while the top keeps moving at full speed. Eventually, there is no water beneath the top of the wave to support it. That's when it curls over itself and breaks onto the beach, carrying you and your boogie board with it. Now that we know how waves work, let's talk about how they cause erosion. Shorelines. The romantic coasts, jagged cliff edges, and tussled shorelines makes me want to put on a pair of tattered trousers and wade into the moonlight brine. A shoreline is simply a place where land and water meet. Each time an ocean waves breaks, it erodes the shoreline. The waves never stop coming. They crash against the shore again and again, weathering the rock into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. The end result is something sparkly and grainy, and the last thing you want to get in your bathing suit. You know what I'm talking about. Sand. Think of it like this. Waves plus rock equals sand. It's math. Those of you who have caught or been caught in a wave before know firsthand just how powerful they can be. That power is what gives waves the ability to pound rock into sand over time. Breaking waves slam into rock with enough force to break bits of it off. The broken off bits of rock get tossed back against the shore again and again. Abrasion by salt and sand and sediment smooths and polishes these stones. All of this happens over and over as the relentless sea slowly grinds that shoreline into sand. A beach is a part of a shoreline that is sort of like a dumping ground for waves. Beaches form as waves deposit all the stuff they have churned up and collected over time. Not surprisingly, beaches are also the places where litter thrown into the ocean gets washed up. So how do you end up with those white, sandy, spring break worthy beaches? Well. The type of sand you have on a beach depends a lot on what types of materials are locally available. Beaches are generally made of eroded materials from nearby cliffs and mountains. They can also contain materials from afar that have been delivered to the coast by rivers. Tonight on the 932 News, sand on the loose. So I was just diving for the ball and it scratched me. I totes didn't see it coming, but you know, I got some, some cream, so, you know, I think, I think it'll heal up okay, not a big deal. Tune in at 932 to learn more. The most abundant mineral found on most beaches is quartz. Quartz is responsible for your standard light-colored sand. But why are some beaches more spectacular than others? Why is the sand on this Florida beach so soft and dreamy white? Well, think about it. Florida is not exactly the land of mountains and rocky coasts. Instead, most Florida beaches are made of pounded shell fragments. So instead of coarse, rough sand, you get sand that's smooth and sparkly white. Check out this Hawaiian beach. It has black sand made from volcanic rock. Far out. Now check this out. This is sea glass. Anyone with a good eye and a basket can collect it on the beach. But where does it come from? Any ideas? Well. I heard that sea glass is the calcified eyeballs of mermaids. 
Sorry about that. What? No. Uh, here's a clue to the real answer. Sea glass is an excellent example of the weathering and erosive powers of the ocean. Still can't guess where it comes from. All right, we'll tell you. Sea glass is bits of discarded bottles, jars, windows, and plates that have been weathered smooth. Leave it to the ocean to turn trash into treasure. Way to go, ocean. Shorelines are constantly changing due to erosion and deposition by ocean waves. Shoreline erosion and conservation. The thing about beaches is that they're disappearing. Shorelines are being eroded faster than the forces of deposition can replenish them. Why is this happening? Well, for one thing, sea levels are rising faster than ever in Earth's history. Some experts suggest that rising sea levels are linked to climate change. Whatever the reason, there's no question that shorelines are receding faster than your dad's hairline. Well, maybe not that fast, but still. More homes and cities than ever around the world now find themselves situated within feet of the coast. Can you think of any reasons why this might spell trouble? For one thing, beaches and wetlands can serve as buffer zones that protect development when storms hit. But when beaches have been eroded away, homes and cities succumb to the constant threat of being destroyed by a storm or flood. Depressing, right? Well, the bright side is that... Wait, what is the bright side? The bright side is that once a problem has been recognized, humans can begin to take action and come up with solutions. In fact, many shorelines around the world have been restored by community members and conservationists.